Good evening, friends, and welcome to the last night of Adam Hamilton's 24 Hours That Changed the World. Uh, before we start, we'll have some classical music until people have a chance to get on to hear this last chapter. Tonight's chapter picks up where last night's left off, which was with the death of Jesus. In the scriptures, Mark 16, verses 1 through 6. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Friday, 6 p.m., an empty tomb near Jerusalem. The first day. With the death of Jesus on Calvary, we witness amid the cacophony of soldiers and criminals, gawkers and passers-by, what looks like the final triumph of evil. All the ugliness and violence we can imagine was embodied in the events that had as their climax the six hours during which God in human form hung on a cross on a hillside outside the gates of Jerusalem. We cannot really appreciate Easter until we have been to the cross. The power of this day lies beyond our comprehension until we have journeyed through hell itself, immersed in the darkest of places. It is only once we have seen the full extent of evil on display there and witnessed the apparent victory of death that we can begin to appreciate the triumph that is Easter. Jesus died at about 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. The Jewish Sabbath would have begun at sunset three hours later. Jewish days end and begin at sunset. And thus, the Passover Sabbath was particularly important. The Jewish authorities did not want the bodies of the crucified still hanging on their crosses, so they petitioned Pilate to hasten their deaths by breaking their legs. The soldiers did so with the thieves, but as they came to Jesus, they found he had already breathed his last. Approximately two hours before sunset, Jesus and the two thieves were taken down from their crosses. Since Jewish regulations did not permit burial on the Sabbath, there was only a short window of time in which to make arrangements and prepare Jesus' body for burial. His disciples had scattered, but all four Gospels tell us that one of his followers, Joseph of Arimathea, was courageous enough to petition Pilate for permission to bury Jesus and that Pilate granted his request. Mark tells us Joseph was a respected member of the council, that is, of the Sanhedrin that had condemned Jesus to death. Matthew tells us he was a rich man and a disciple of Jesus. Luke describes him as a good and righteous man, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. John tells us he was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews. The composite picture they paint dispels the notion that only the poor, the uneducated, and sinners were followers of Jesus, and it shows us that not all the Jewish religious leaders sought Jesus' death. Joseph's fear of identifying himself publicly as one of Jesus' disciples 
makes him not unlike a number of respected members of society I have known. They fear what others might think of them if they were to identify themselves as persons who take their faith seriously. What might have been the cost to Joseph, a respected and wealthy member of Jewish society, had he identified himself as one of Jesus' disciples? If he had done so regardless, publicly declaring his support for Jesus, how might he have influenced others? How might things have turned out differently? In what ways do you identify with Joseph? Are you ever a secret disciple for fear of what others will think? Joseph's fear apparently left him when Jesus died and he hurried to prepare the body for burial. John tells us he was joined by another secret disciple of Jesus, Nicodemus, who was also a leader of the Jews. Nicodemus brought with him approximately 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes, and the two men, with no time for full burial preparations, which would have taken several hours, quickly cleaned Jesus' body and wrapped it in a linen shroud. Matthew tells us Joseph placed Jesus in his own new tomb, freshly hewn in the rock, in what John describes as a garden area near the site of Jesus' crucifixion. Joseph then had a large stone rolled in front of the entrance. If we combine the gospel accounts, the total number of people in attendance at Jesus' interment was four. Joseph, Nicodemus, and two of the women who followed Jesus, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, were the only ones who dared to come. The apostles were behind locked doors, terrified they might be arrested and subject to the fate that had befallen their Lord. With sunset came the Passover Sabbath, and while others celebrated, those who knew and loved Jesus were in shock, traumatized by what they had witnessed. The second day. We have no record of what occurred that Friday night following the crucifixion and burial or throughout the day on Saturday. We're left to imagine and interpolate based upon what we read in the Gospels. Matthew tells us Pilate set a guard at the tomb because, according to the Pharisees, Jesus had said something about rising from the dead. They worried that the disciples might take Jesus' body and claim he had indeed risen. Luke says simply that on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. John gives us the detail that on Sunday the disciples were in a house with the doors locked for fear of being arrested, and it seems likely they had been there since Friday night. Some have speculated that this was the same upper room where Jesus celebrated the Passover with them on Thursday night and where the disciples would meet on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit descended upon them. It would be difficult to overstate the depths to which the disciples' spirits must have fallen. Fear that they could face Jesus' fate was just part of it. There was also the guilt. They knew Judas was not the only one who had betrayed him. Peter could not shake the moment when his eyes met Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest after his denial that he even knew him. The rest had fled in Jesus' hour of need. Only John stood near the cross. The others watched from a distance. None had shown up for Jesus' burial. They felt themselves to be cowards. Guilt and fear were not all they carried in their hearts that day, however. They had left everything to follow Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah who would restore Israel. They believed that God was with him in powerful ways and that he had the words of life. In him they had seen goodness personified. He had shown them love, mercy, and grace. Now the unthinkable had happened. Evil, perpetrated by those who claimed to be righteous, had defeated goodness. Rome's soldiers had defeated God's Messiah. Their king was gone. Their hopes and dreams, even their faith, had been crucified with them, and they must have sunk into utter despair. As I think of the disciples on this second day after Jesus' death, I'm reminded of the many times I've sat with families following the death of a young person of sitting in a hospital waiting room with two dozen teenagers as their friend's life support was removed, of silence sprinkled with intermittent sobs as I sat in the home of the family of a young woman who was murdered. Now and then there are attempts at normalcy in times such as these, but nothing can lift the pall of death or the feeling in the heart when the weight of grief presses down upon it. This is the second day, the day after. It's a day we will all know. It's the day after the diagnosis of terminal cancer the day after a spouse walks out, leaving your life, your future, your hopes, and your heart in tatters. It's the day after the lawsuit is filed against you, and the day after the verdict. It's the day after 9-11, the day the news is still sinking in and you realize your life will change forever. It's the day when the world seems so dark that hope is nowhere to be found. Yet even on this day, with despair and unseen yet palpable presence, occasionally one of the disciples must have spoken up and said, what was it he said about Jonah being in the belly of the well for three days? And the others would dismiss the comment, and then a second disciple would speak up. Didn't he say something about destroying the temple and in three days it be, could be rebuilt? 
Could he have been talking about being restored to life? To which the others would reply, no, that's not what he meant. Still another would say, I could swear he did say that the Son of Man would be put to death, but he would rise again. These words of Jesus had not been understood when he uttered them, and even now they seemed absurd. Four people had seen his tortured body placed in the tomb. It was unfathomable that he would return. What was the Spirit of Jesus doing on this second day? Did he rest on the Sabbath as his body lay in the tomb, or did he, as affirmed in one version of the Apostles' Creed, descend into hell? This doctrine, known in medieval English as the herring of hell, held that at his death, Jesus descended to the place of the dead, what the Old Testament calls Sheol, then set free the righteous dead so they might ascend to heaven and preach the gospel to all who had never heard it. The scriptural origin of this idea may be found in 1 Peter chapter 3. There we read, He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. And the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead. Scholars debate the meaning of these verses, but they may point us toward what Jesus was doing on that Saturday. He may have done in the realm of the dead what he sought to do in his earthly ministry, to seek out and save the lost. This doctrine in these verses would point to the depth of the passion Jesus has for reaching people who have been alienated from God. Matthew, in his account of the crucifixion, tells the curious story that when Jesus died, some who had been dead were raised to life and appeared to many. This, too, might be a scriptural anchor for the idea that Jesus set free those in the realm of Sheol who were righteous. Some go further and suggest that by entering the underworld ruled by Satan, Jesus faced Satan himself and defeated him, not destroying him, but demonstrating his power over him. Even Martin Luther, in his solid declaration, suggested the devil was conquered in this descent to the dead. We believe simply, he wrote, that the entire person, God and human being, descended to hell after his burial, conquered the devil, destroyed the power of hell, and took from the devil all his power. Both of these ideas are captured in classical art, showing the gates of hell broken and Jesus leading Adam and Eve and the righteous of the Old Testament out of the realm of the dead toward the gates of heaven. What Jesus actually did in the spirit while his body lay in the tomb will remain a mystery. But for his followers left behind on earth, the period between his death and resurrection was as dark a time as any ever known. Holy Saturday represents despair and utter hopelessness. The third day. The third day began at sunset on Saturday night, but it was not until morning that Mary Magdalene discovered the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. The details differ in each gospel, but all agree that this woman who had been set free by Jesus from demonic possession or mental illness was the first on the scene. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us she was accompanied by one or more other women, and they had come with scented oils to anoint Jesus' body. The women were thunderstruck by what they saw. The stone had been rolled away from the mouth of the tomb. They ran to the tomb, afraid somebody had taken Jesus' body to desecrate it and humiliate him further. The Gospels vary somewhat in their account of what happens next. According to Mark, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. Matthew identifies him as an angel, a Greek word meaning messenger. Luke says that suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. John also, to also tells us there were two angels in white. They said, why are you weeping? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. With that, the women ran off to find the disciples. The Easter chronology varies slightly in the four gospel accounts, but one thing is clear. The idea that Jesus had been raised from the dead was considered unbelievable. In Mark, the women learned Jesus had been raised, but they were filled with terror and were afraid to tell anybody. In Matthew, even after the disciples saw him on the mountain in Galilee, some doubted. In Luke, Mary and the others told the disciples Jesus had been raised, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. According to Luke, Peter ran to the tomb, but while amazed, it is not clear whether he understood what had happened. In John's account, Peter and John ran to the tomb, but though they saw the linen wrappings lying there, they still did not understand. Then there's doubting Thomas, who missed the first resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples. Thomas told them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. How grateful I am for the Gospels and their willingness to record that even the disciples struggled with doubt when it came to the resurrection. If the men and women who were with Jesus found it difficult to believe, how much more so for people who live 2,000 years later and have not seen an empty tomb or the living Christ with their own eyes. 
As a pastor, I find Easter both the most powerful and the most challenging Sunday on which to preach each year. It is challenging precisely because the events we celebrate are difficult to believe. Several dimensions of the story leave modern hearers joining with Thomas, saying, Unless I see, I will not believe. Some interpreters have sought to make it easier to believe the Easter story. They've suggested alternatives to what the Gospels record. Maybe Jesus wasn't really dead and he was resuscitated. Or maybe he was dead and the tomb wasn't really, the tomb wasn't really empty. The women and the disciples merely shared in a vision precipitated by wishful thinking. But the early church boldly asserted that the tomb was empty, that Jesus was bodily risen, that he appeared to the apostles and to hundreds of others over a period of 40 days. They saw him and talked with him. They touched his hands and assured themselves he really was alive. He was not a ghost. He was there with them. He even ate a meal with them. He taught them and encouraged them. Thus, Matthew ends his gospel with these words Jesus spoke to his disciples. This is what I want you to do, he told them. I want you to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. I want you to make disciples of all people. Teach them what I taught you. Baptize them. And then he said, And lo, even though you may not see me, you need to know this. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, until this age is over, I will be with you always. There are many things in this world I don't fully understand, and many of which seem completely absurd to me. Much of the realm of physics falls into this category. Did everything in the universe really come from an initial mass the size of the head of a pen? I don't see how that's possible, but current theories of the origin of the universe suggest this is so. Is my body really made up of atoms, each of which includes a nucleus surrounded by an electron cloud with constantly moving charged particles? I don't fully understand this, but I trust it's so. There are a host of other ideas I've studied in physics that are so mind-boggling I can't even describe them. So I ask myself, is it possible for the God who created the universe, who formed the atom, who wrote the DNA software that forms all living things, to reanimate or transform and resurrect the physical body of Jesus after his death? Ask this way, the resurrection does not seem so incredible. Along with the question of the resurrection of Jesus' earthly body lies the larger question of whether there is life after death at all. The two are intertwined. If Jesus was raised from the dead, there is evidence for the reality of life after death. And if there's life after death, then Jesus' own resurrection would not seem difficult to believe. There's doubt, no doubt the disciples were transformed following the resurrection. These people who had deserted Jesus because they were afraid, who hid behind locked doors rather than help bury him, were now in the streets of Jerusalem, proclaiming him to everyone. Do with us what you want, they said. Kill us if you must, but we have to tell you. The one who you crucified we have seen raised from the dead. He is, in fact, the Son of God. He is the King of glory, the Savior of the world. They went from there throughout the world proclaiming the good news. They faced difficult times. They were arrested again and again, beaten, abused, and thrown into prison. Tradition has it that all but one of them were put to death for their faith, but they would never again dwell in those dark places of the Spirit. No more would they feel the doubt and despair they felt before they had seen their risen Lord. They faced life with hope and confidence. When we hear, trust, and celebrate the Easter story, we reclaim the same faith and discover the same joy and hope the first disciples has. Easter has the power to change us. The personal experience of many different people leads me to conclude that there is life after death. I'll recount just a few of more than 50 experiences shared with me over the years. I once sat with a man who was dying. Seated in his wheelchair, he asked if I could see them, referring to people he could see that I could not. Not long afterward, he passed away. A woman dying in her nursing home bed with her daughters by her side said, Can you hear them? Her daughters told her they didn't hear anything. You can't hear them, she said. They're calling my name. They asked, Who, Mom? She named her deceased husband, her parents, and others who had passed on. Another woman told me recently of being awakened in the night. She looked up from her bed only to see her deceased husband who had passed away several months before. There was a light shining on him, and he smiled at her and then vanished as she sat up in the bed wide awake. Some time ago, I was sharing Don Piper's book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, with a group of pastors. Piper was declared dead, had an experience of the afterlife, and then was brought back to life. A pastor came to me afterwards and said my experience was very much like his. He told me that he had been in a coma and that the prospects of, his, of him coming out of it were so dim that his family decided to remove the life support. He told me he could hear his family members' tearful goodbyes. At that moment, an old friend who had died years before called his name. 
The friend told him not to worry. He was going to be okay. The pastor felt a great peace come over him, and he felt a desire to follow his friend. He told me that what stood out to him was the sound of singing and music that seemed to emanate from heaven. Shortly afterward, he opened his eyes and was restored to life. He told me, I will never forget the peace and assurance that what was on the other side of death was marvelous. I could go on and on with stories like these. To me, the variety of these experiences points to something real. And if there is life after death, then the testimony of the disciples, the women, and the others that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead seems quite plausible. The fact is, the disciples were radically changed, empowered, emboldened, and filled with hope as a result of their encounter with the resurrected Christ. The Apostle Paul reports that over 500 people saw Christ after the resurrection. He himself had an encounter with the risen Christ, a vision that transformed him from an enemy of Christianity to its greatest proponent. To me, the leap of faith required to believe in the resurrection of Jesus is small, I'm content to leave how it happened, the specific details of the resurrection in the realm of mystery, but that he was raised, I feel content to trust as fact. The resurrection is not simply about a dead man being restored to life. Its power lies in its meaning, and here the resurrection seems to me to be the perfect and essential ending to the gospel story. The resurrection of Christ, like his crucifixion, is a word from God speaking a profound truth that changes everything. This story defined the very lives of the earliest disciples. The Apostle Paul summarized the role of the resurrection in the gospel message this way. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10.9. That leads to the last of the theories of atonement we'll consider in this book. It's often referred to as Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. This view, popularized by Swedish theologian and bishop Gustav Allen, is said to be a restating of one of the dominant views of atonement held by the earliest church. It holds that the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ must be taken together as a powerful word from God, announcing God's victories over the powers of evil and over the sin that alienates us from God. They are God's triumph over death, which we by faith share in. I do not know that Alan used this metaphor, but I find it helpful. In Jesus Christ, God entered a boxing arena to take on a very powerful enemy. This enemy, like the Philistine giant Goliath of old, held humanity captive. Human beings live in a world where might is right and where evil so often seems to be the victor. Even the righteous of Jesus' day were shown in the story of Christ's betrayal, kind admission, and death to be petty, jealous slaves to their own sin. And all of us are prisoners to the forces of death. The reality of our enslavement to evil, sin, and death is evident all around us. It's seen in the 30,000 children who die each day of hunger and diseases related to malnutrition while others have plenty. It's seen in the continued wars and violent conflicts across the globe. It's seen in the selfishness and greed that have led to economic catastrophe. And it's seen in the pain we bring upon each other in our interpersonal relationships. In Jesus, God entered the boxing arena where evil seems to have the upper hand. He took the worst blows of the enemy, being subject to the powers that conspired to destroy him. He was beaten, abused, and eventually knocked out. But just when the match seemed lost, Jesus arose, and in his resurrection, he dealt a finishing blow to the forces of evil, sin, and death. Christ became the victor. With his victory, all humankind was offered the opportunity to join forces with him, to be set free from the power of evil, sin, and death, and to live lives of hope, freedom, and love. Human beings still must choose to side with him. They're not forced to leave their enslavement to sin and death. They, the battle between good and evil will continue until Christ's return, but his death and resurrection dealt a decisive blow to the forces of evil and demonstrated the ultimate victory of God over it. John's account of the resurrection is the richest in symbolism, and he includes a host of clues pointing to the meaning of the victory Christ wrought through his death and resurrection. Only John tells us Jesus' tomb was in a garden. We're meant to recall that the entire biblical narrative begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden. There the devil tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God and pursue self-deification, bringing evil into the world. Humanity has been enslaved by self-interest and disobedience as well as by guilt and shame ever since. But in the garden where Jesus' tomb was located, we see a reversal of Eden giving those who choose to follow the crucified and risen Christ the chance to share in its restoration. 
They will work and pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. John mentions that Mary Magdalene found two angels inside the tomb, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the feet. We're meant to envision in this scene the mercy seat of God, the symbolic throne that was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. This is where the high priest offered the blood of atonement and made sin offerings before God. It reminds us that Christ has conquered death and administers mercy to all who call upon him. Christ's resurrection is a vindication of his message, his identity, and his death on the cross. In his message, Jesus taught a way of life based upon the love of God and neighbor. He ministered to lost and broken people. One of the things that upset the religious authorities was that Jesus sat down with drunkards and prostitutes. He let them be part of his ministry. He taught that God was like a father who had two sons, one of whom ran away. The father was always waiting for that son to come back home again. He never stopped loving the runaway. That was the approach Jesus embodied in his ministry. His message about what God was like was completely countercultural. Blessed are the poor, the hungry, the meek, the lowly, the peacemakers. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. When a Roman soldier beats you on the face, turn the other cheek and let him beat that one as well. When he demands that you carry his pack for a mile, carry it a second mile. Love not only your neighbors, but also your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't forgive them just seven times, but 70 times seven. These were all bizarre statements. How could anybody really live that way? But what he taught was then vindicated by his resurrection. The claims Jesus made about his own identity seemed just as bizarre. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hunger and hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet will they live. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He repeatedly reinterpreted the traditions and teachings of the Jewish people, saying, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, but I say to you, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. He claimed to be the Messiah, the son of the living God. It was an idea the religious authorities and those awaiting a military Messiah rejected, but he claimed it yet again when questioned at his trial. All his claims were vindicated with his resurrection, something Paul notes in Romans 1.4 when he writes that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. The resurrection also confirmed the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross, that it fulfilled a divine purpose, bringing about the forgiveness of sins. Luke captures this idea in a statement Jesus made to the disciples after the resurrection. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. In all three areas, his message, his identity, and his death on the cross, Jesus' resurrection vindicated everything he said, everything he did, everything he was and is. Ultimately, the resurrection is the dramatic sign of God's victory over all the forces that conspired against Jesus. Not just the Sanhedrin and the Romans, but all the forces of evil in the world. The resurrection is also God's sign of victory over death. It signals that sin, evil, and death will not have the final word, though they may appear for a time to have the upper hand. The resurrection is a shout of victory over all these things, proof that goodness, justice, and life will ultimately prevail. Paul writes, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christus Victor says the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus are God's response to the sin of evil, injustice, tragedy, and pain in this world. Jesus experienced all these things and he triumphed over them. He invites all who choose to follow him to live as God's people, free from the power of sin and the fear of death. The power of Easter, and with it the Christus Victor theory of atonement, can be summarized in one word, hope. Hope is the sense that things will work out, that despite difficult circumstances and painful situations that might lead to despair, Something good is around the bend. Boy, we need that right now, don't we, folks? It is something we cannot live without. Dr. Jerome Grootman, who holds a chair in medicine at Harvard, notes in his book, The Anatomy of Hope, hope gives us the courage to confront our circumstances and the capacity to surmount them. For all my patients, hope, true hope, has proved as important as any medication I might prescribe 
or any procedure I might perform. This is what the story of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection brings to us. Much of what's happening in our world is frightening. Several years ago, Time Magazine had a cover story about global warming that carried this headline, Be worried, be very worried. I believe global warming is a real threat and that Christians should be at the forefront of environmental stewardship, but I will not ultimately live my life in fear of it. Why? Because I believe that Christ is the victor and that global warming will not have the final word. The continuing threat of terrorism is also very real. I believe we must find ways to address the underlying issues that create an environment for terrorists to flourish. But I will not live in fear of terrorism because Christ is the victor and I do not believe terrorism will ultimately have the final word. In 2008, a global, global economic crisis struck the world, one that will require fundamental changes in our relationship with money and affect nearly everybody one way or the other. Still, not either a global economic crisis can negate the fact that Christ is still the victor. And we can add in there, can't we, friends, here in 2020, a depression and a pandemic at the same time are not enough to shake our belief that Christ is the victor. Knowing that Jesus will have the final word gives us courage when we face the problems of our day. That knowledge doesn't call us to hide in a room. It doesn't lead us to bury our heads and say we don't care about the problems we face. Of course we care about what's happening in our world. And because of that resurrection, we're able to face those things with hope and courage. Words attributed to Frederick Beekner capture it well. Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Over the years, I've cared for and loved many people in my congregation as they approach death. One remarkable man expressed the sense of the victory of Christ as well as anybody I've known. After years of trying to have children, he and his wife finally brought a little girl into the world. Then months later, he was diagnosed with a rare, aggressive form of cancer. I sat by his bedside as the illness took over his body. He exhibited a remarkable faith in the midst of it. He said, I know God doesn't give his children cancer. This is simply part of life. Of course I'm praying to be made well. That's my desire. But even more than my own healing, I'm praying that somehow in the midst of my battle with cancer, the glory of God might be revealed in my life. He went on to say, I know that Christ is risen, and because he lives, I will live. I know he's prepared a place for me. I'm not afraid. And I trust he will send people to care for my wife and my daughter. Like Paul, if I live longer, I will be grateful for that and hope to be useful to him. But if the cancer runs its natural course, I know I will be with him, and I am grateful for that. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die, to die is gain. I've served as the senior pastor of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection for almost 20 years as of this writing. I was 25 when my wife, daughters, and I founded the church. Every Easter for 20 years, I've ended my Easter sermon with the same words. People ask me, do you really believe the story of the resurrection? And my answer is always the same. I not only believe it, I'm counting on it. I end this book with the words of Isaac Watts. They're from a hymn focused on the cross, and I believe they capture best the response God desires from us as we consider the events of the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining me for these seven nights. I hope that you have enjoyed this and have gotten something from it, and I hope that above all that you get a sense of hope even in these difficult times. And so, until I see you again, have a good night and a better tomorrow. God bless.